Hey everybody, this is Human Factors Cast episode 27, or if you're keeping track, what the hell is going on with America? We got a great show for you today. We're going to have some fun stuff with Human Pig Factors Cast. We got a we're going to play some guess that Human Factors and uh, hear from you guys. Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, Human Factors fans. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Billy Hall. Hey, everybody. There he is. And Blake Arnsdorf. What's up, guys? How are you doing today? Good, good. We're back. Another, another week. Another Monday. I'm excited. This week was filled with news. Um, <laughs> per any other week. <laughs> it was. Yeah, there's there's a lot of political news, and it's going to be hard to avoid it. Uh, so, <laughs> so let's tackle it head on. I mean, you know, we're going to try to remain as neutral as we can on these. Um, I mean, obviously... We all have our own political opinions, but we're going to try to remain as politically neutral on these as we can and talk about the science behind it and and sort of leave the politics out of it as best we can, as best we can. No promises, no promises. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, let's go ahead and we ready to jump into Human Factors News, guys? Let's hop in it. All right. Uh, there's a lot of news this week. So this is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. Now, this could be anything from virtual reality, automation, psychology, design, anything that has to do within the field of Human Factors. Billy, what do we have up first? Be sure to set your doomsday clock ahead 30 seconds tonight. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist has published a graphic of the clock ever since 1947. It illustrates the threat of nuclear war to humanity. The bulletin cited several reasons for the decision, but called out Donald Trump's disturbing comments about the use and proliferation of nuclear weapons. Crazy, right? Insane. Now, see, I always noticed this thing from... um, I remember this thing from the Watchmen of all things. You know what I mean? I thought it was a thing. Was it from in the Watchmen? Watchmen until recently? Yeah, remember? It was always about the idea, of, like the Doomsday Clock ticks a little bit closer because of the threat of nuclear war with the Russians and stuff like that. Dude, you're so right. And that's I, right. Yeah. The whole time when you when I read this article, I was like, "This is real. This is an actual thing." But now that you bring <laughs> that up, I totally know what you're talking about. I didn't even think about Watchmen. I mean. The- yeah, this is uh, calling out Donald Trump on this. This is, I mean, again, political, but we're trying to stay neutral. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, it was an interesting thing, right? Because if he, it, this is coming from the bulletin of atomic scientists. What's interesting about this is that they've moved it thirty seconds, and they've never moved it in that increment before. It's always been a minute. Yeah, but if you read the article, what is the like objective criteria they're doing this off of? Just based off of stuff that Trump has said. This is this is the committee that gets together and says, yeah, yeah, it's based off what he said about, you know, um, nuclear weapons, basically. Yeah, it, it, but it, being, a fuck, being a scientist, I want to actually... <laughs> Do we need to yeah, censor I that? I want to be tables. I want tables. I want charts. I want graphs. I want to be like, ah, did you see what he tweeted today? That's going to add three seconds. Oh, <laughs> so, you, so you want to quantify each tweet. Right? <laughs> see, I would be happier with that. I guess I guess maybe I was just looking for some more hard reasons why to move it forward. I get I, the stuff okay. he's saying is bad. Okay, look, hundred percent. He's he's a he's a he's the leader of a nation, and he's saying this stuff. Yes, but why? How is that quantifiable in terms of moving something thirty seconds why? forward? And other question: Why him? Because I mean, North Korea has been talking about that sort of stuff. We've yeah, heard but that's about, what like, nuclear testing programs. We've never heard about this clock until now. Yeah, but Billy, yeah. no, that's what got us to fifty-eight. That's <laughs> what is. What are we at? I, I don't even know. We're at like fifty eight minutes. I guess we're at like yeah. fifty eight point five minutes yeah. or something like that now. It's crazy. All right. Anyway, let's 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 hit the next subject. All right. All right. Set your doomsday clock, people. All right. So last Thursday, White House press secretary Sean Spicer appears to have tweeted and quickly deleted a string of nonsense. That looks considerably more like a password than it does a pocket tweet. Uh oh, this is not now, so good. 
Now, I got to be honest with you. I've made this, you know, like you'll be texting a message or you'll be entering in a password and you enter it into the wrong place or you Oops. look something up, but it's in the wrong, like, field. But, like, now you know it's changed, but still people are jumping on it. Like, how many times has he used this? Right. Well, it's not only that, but, I mean... If he gave any, if this, okay, so first off, let me let me be clear. We're not sure that this was a password. Not at all. But the fact that it's like alternating like eight. It looks like one. It looks like one. It's like alternating numeric and then um, and then uh, letters. It's, uh, numbers then letters. Numbers and letters. And it keeps repeating. And so, yeah, it does look like a password. Uh, now, now, to be fair, we don't know that this is for sure a password. It just looks like one. And he could have. He could have changed it right after it. But, I mean, here's the thing. This is a person in a powerful position as the White House press secretary. What does this do to open up doors for yeah. cybersecurity? Like, this is this is a huge threat. Well, I mean, all right, let's really think about it. It's two separate passwords that popped up in close proximity to each other, right? So what if he's just using a password generator and it's like a copy and paste thing? The my Where my head jumped to on it was how is this happening that you can just pocket tweet something? Cause I've been on Twitter for a long time and I have never had a problem like that. Right. So, it's like you well, have to open up the app and then, yeah. I mean, even if it was a copy and paste issue, like, like what are you doing to even make that happen? Do you just have like an well, automatic? You would, imagine, you would imagine that he would be on Twitter a lot because any, any recent press secretary has to at least be aware of it, especially since Trump likes to tweet a lot of things you would think the press secretary would have to be on it as well, you know, keep up to date, get ready things, you know, prepare what to say. So he can kind of get a little bit of a notice between people asking questions or backlash or promotional stuff. And I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt with promotional things. Right. right I know. <laughs> but I mean, you know what the thing that, you know what really gets me though? You know what I think it was? I think that it was like, on his hot bar of like, you know how like when you type things into your phone, it kind of guesses ah. what you're going to say. Yeah, it guesses your password <laughs> when you go to yeah, write a tweet. I think that's what it is? I think it's a hot bar thing that he's typed a lot into a thing. Huh. So you know, maybe that's what it was, and it just kind of popped up like that. You know, that's a really I good think point. The second one, the second one was actually on purpose to make it look like it was a pocket tweet because he was like one of those moments where it's like, oh crap. Oops. What I don't understand is. Are you telling me the American government doesn't have a way to stop a text message or a tweet? Right. Come on. Now, look, here's they the thing. Should, well, probably not if you really think about it. that. And so so why is this on Human Factors Cast? So obviously there's something going on that is stopping him from either entering this in the correct place, if that was indeed what happened. So he's, he's entering the password in the wrong place. There wasn't clear to the user mm-hmm. or it's user error or or... Uh, there's some human factors issues with the phone itself. Like it opened itself up, it opened Twitter up and you know, they, they butt dialed. So there's, there's some human factors issues here. Ooh, that's even more interesting too. Like what if it's somebody, cause if you, I jump to some problem in the UI, that there's just something going on that's making it easy for him to do this. But Twitter's pretty locked pad. I mean, you have to type something and then you have to press tweet. Right. Well, you have to, yeah, You first you have to open the app too. That's true. So, so I was thinking maybe somebody's poking around in his phone and just tweeting in on his behalf. Mm, it's a, be. I don't know. It's It all kind of seems very strange because if know, it's a password generator, those are bad passwords. You know yeah. what the though we haven't considered? That Sean Spicer doesn't actually do his own tweets. That's very true. Trump doesn't you know, for him, I mean, I'm sure. <laughs> it could have just been a random person. That's why they haven't been able to find anything about it, because it's just some dude who has a cell phone who's like, you know, an intern who uses that tweet. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's such a weird thing. All it right. Is. It really is weird. All, All right. right. Enough about so, tweets. What's up next? They <laughs> released the latest designs for their new spacesuit this week. Astronaut Eric Bowe said in a press release that the most important part is that the suit will keep you alive. That's good. <laughs> Duh, right? And also that the suit is a lot lighter, more form-fitting, and it's simpler, which is always a good thing. He goes on to mention complicated systems have more ways they can break. 
So simple is better than nothing like th- than something like this. Now, the th- mention is the fact that some nerd worked on that from Twenty One, a space odyssey. No, you're right. <laughs> it's interesting because Two thousand one, a space odyssey. That is the spacesuit from the space odyssey. I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh. Can we put Dave? Is he Dave? I wanted his name to be Dave so bad. No, you're right. Uh, I think it's it's interesting because now we have this generation of designers and human factors practitioners and all these other geeks that grew up with this stuff. Geeks, nerds, whatever you want to call them, uh, however you self-identify. Um, I mean... This is this is cool. Like if if I got a chance to design something that looked like a Star Wars interface, you betcha I would. It's pretty cool. I mean, and I like the fact that it's so minimalist. It looks like it's a lot lighter weight and all and everything. Well, uh, the thing is, they 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 um they highlight the simplicity here. They they realized that there was this clunkiness with the other spacesuits, and they really tried to you know make it so that way there's as little problems that can go wrong as possible. Because when you look at, um, there's this thing called failure modes, effect criticality analysis. It's F E M C A. If you want to, sorry, what failure modes, effect criticality analysis. I'm about to describe it because it's, it's one of those sort of things out there in human factors. It's basically taking the sum of the system, right? And all these little parts, Right. So imagine uh-huh. imagine you have an assembly line with a million different moving pieces. Right. So one piece breaks. How does that affect the whole assembly line? And so this I'm sorry, what was that? I get you. I okay. get you. So okay. this this analysis is basically how does that affect the entire assembly line? And I, I can see someone at Boeing saying something like this where they're like, OK, this space, this current spacesuit that we have ton of problems how do we fix this um because if one thing breaks they die or whatever it is you know they want to make we it gotta get to this planet quick right oh, they... i'm kidding i'm kidding <laughs> need something to look sleek thing and survive on mars with did you see the doomsday clock we gotta go go we, go. <laughs> we gotta go um <laughs> no so so i bet they designed this with that in mind they they wanted to keep something simple easy to replace easy to fix they they mention here the systems too system Yet you can, you, the best part of it though, that I thought was insane, but really cool as far as what they must be developing technology wise, is you can use your phone or oh. you can use like tablet technology with the gloves. Yeah, I have that in my notes. That it allows oh, yeah. astronauts to use touch screens in space. That's pretty cool. In space. <laughs> yeah, but like space is very cold. Isn't most of these things like totally, uh, uh, sensitive like a lot of touch screens are heat sensitive like if you get they're cold, capacitive it won't register your movements and stuff like that right no no most touch screen technology is capacitive so what that means is it 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 takes the um in your skin you have uh it, it, your skin conducts electricity basically and what happens is when you touch a touch screen that's a capacitive touch screen like you would find on your phones or your tablets or whatever your your laptops Capacitive touchscreen basically creates a circuit between your finger and the screen, and that circuit registers where your finger is on the screen. So what they've oh, dude. what they've done is when they've developed this this spacesuit, they um, used a material that also completes a circuit, so they can actually it's like those touch touch uh, screen gloves that you can wear in the cold. Uh, those that material just completes a circuit. Well, I an uncommon the fact that it looks like 2001: A Space Odyssey. Didn't they say that you know people would uh, the cell phones came because of Star Trek and communicators and things like that? I mean, don't they say that's a lot of the inspiration? Yeah, the I... whole reason we want flying cars is because you know we all want to be like Flash Gordon. Flash. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, like I just said, I, I I throw Star Wars in my designs and no one seems to notice, and that's how it gets by. So anyway, next. What's up next? <laughs> okay. So there's a new way to wake up Amazon Echo smart speaker, and Trekkies are excited over this one. The newest wake word for Amazon e- uh, voice-activated Echo and the Echo Dot smart speaker is computer, proving uh, joining the previous three, Alexa, Amazon, and Echo. So computer, 
And that's going to re- go do so many problems. Oh that's yeah, so many problems. Hey, could you go turn on the computer? And then it goes. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. This is this is one of those novelty things. <laughs> or the TV. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or it, the TV. Every time they were like, he hacked the computers. What? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny that you say that because there um there was a news story on TV a couple weeks ago, and they were talking about the Amazon Alexa, Alexa and how or the Amazon Echo, and they said, Alexa, order me this in the news seg- segment, and a ton of people, their echo, their echoes went off, and they ordered them this thing, and so so there was a ton of cancellations, and Amazon had to do some PR nightmare stuff. But uh, Isn't that kind of ridiculous, though? Because that's happened with Siri, too. You would think it's, they would learn from each other's think, problems. But, I mean, that was the news outlet's fault for, for yeah. saying that in the report. Well, I mean, podcasts do it too, and it's all over the place. I mean, oh yeah, all the time. yeah. Oh shoot, we just uh, we just said Alexa order whatever, but I mean, we're saying whatever, and she'll say, <laughs> "I'm sorry, I didn't." Want. <laughs> Actually, for all of you listening right now, please put <laughs> put your podcast listening app next to your Amazon Echo, and I will say, Amazon Alexa Echo Computer, please order me five thousand cases of Bounty. Uh, Shoot, what are those? Paper towels? Paper towels. <laughs> Bounty paper towels. She won't get that. Anyway. <laughs> yes. This this uh this podcast is not brought to you by Bounty. Um No, this is fun. We just uh Blake and I just played around with this. Uh it's kind of cool to say computer. I mean, I'm not a Trekkie, like we all know, I'm a Star Wars guy, but it, this this was kind of cool to play around with it. It feels more natural to me to address a computer or a, an AI as computer rather than a name or to give it an identity. I like giving it an identity for some reason. But I, th- I feel like this is a smart play on Amazon's part because this is going to just get people to buy it. Or I feel like I know people that just because they've like thrown some Trekkie thing in there that they're just going to buy an Echo Dot now. Well, the real, the real challenge will be, or, or I guess the real selling point will be when you can create your own wake word, right? When you can say your favorite AI from any franchise. I'd be 3PO. And have Anthony Daniels answer me, or uh, Kit, or Jarvis, or whatever you want. <laughs> you know, all these. Or all... just be able to come up with your own name. Right, exactly. Charlie, whatever it is. Charles. Charles, what are we gonna be able to have? What are we going to be able to have the voice of the computer on our on our Alexa instead of it? That would be cool. Right. Yeah. Know? No, I was. It was funny because uh, when Blake and I tried it out a little bit earlier here, we were we were actually hoping that it would respond in the computer's voice, but that it did not. Really cool. It did not. It was still Alexa. Okay, Billy, what's up next? Okay, so let's see here. Next on it, uh, so we're going into this. Match is rolling out a new feature that will help its dating app customers see who they've crossed path paths with in the real world and say hi if they're interested in chatting the opt-in feature called misconnections takes advantage of location-based services on the user's phone but is designed in a way to ensure users privacy now this one was a little bit creepy for me yeah it's creepy but at the same time so i was reading this article and they basically go into it and say okay if you were in a coffee shop and someone else was in that coffee shop they'll say that you guys cross paths within like two blocks. So they won't say you guys were both in the coffee shop. So one of you could be in the coffee shop and then one of you could be in a coffee shop two blocks away. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the idea here is that if you recognize the face and you gave them flirty looks in the coffee shop, then you can go, Oh, I saw you at the coffee shop, but I was too shy to say anything. Let's see if we hit it off. Uh, And the, the key part of this thing about that though. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I mean, here's the thing. I'm I, I'm an attractive female in the mid twenties who uses Match.com, you know, and I'm sitting in my coffee shop enjoying my latte, working on my Twitter feed or right. whatever. And uh, I look at my phone because the person says he wants to be high and says two blocks away, so I say, eh, no. Sudden, a guy from there just stands up and yells at me that I no. am a dumb female dog. No, and that. That that would no. not happen because this this is missed connections. So this works very much like the Craigslist missed connections works, where it happens later. It it will oh. come up hours later. 
So oh. because of this very reason that you're illustrating right now. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. It, it shows that they obviously, obviously put a lot of thought into it. Yes, because if they did launch this without any sort of... One person in that room thing. I'm sorry, what was that, Billy? No, I was like, there has to have been one person in that room who was like, no, this is a bad idea unless we do it this way. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, you would think. But, I mean, there are some things that happen that slip through design that should be common sense, and they're not. Um, but, yeah, no, this is. This, I thought this was cool. I like that it's a opt-in feature. It's not something you have to do because there is a lot that freaks me out when we're taking a lot of loca- location-based data and just using it. Um, I think I think it's a kind of cool thing if people like using Match.com and if the app's like well designed. But definitely glad it's an opt-in yeah. feature and not like a built-in thing. Yeah. So one of the dangers is, let's say that is your favorite coffee shop, and they they sh- though they were like, oh, this this person, male or female, was at this coffee shop today. I wonder if they're going to be there tomorrow. They won't tell you that that's the coffee shop, but you know it's within two blocks. So you drive around those two blocks looking for the person. It's it's creepy. It can get it, weird real fast. It, yeah, it could. So this, be careful, listeners. If you're if you're on Match. dot com, uh, just be careful with who has your location data. Uh, sounds cool, but <laughs> well, I mean, the good that's thing, my advice. Yeah, the good part is they say that it, they ensure user privacy. So hopefully they're they I stay have up a with question that. Question for you guys though, real Go ahead. quick before we move on to the next topic. Yeah, real what's quick. up? Um, Match. Whoa, first, we lost, uh, one of our first earlier episodes was on. Uh, say again. We lost you, Billy. What? What, you, what were you saying? Sorry about that. Weird connection. <laughs> Misconnection there. Misconnection. Um, there. <laughs> so, one of our earlier episodes, we did uh, uh, one of the dating apps. Which one was it? Tinder. Tinder. Tinder yeah, we did Tinder. And uh, another thing about it was, is Match. dot com though you to be a member and i'm assuming you would have to be a paid to have this feature you probably. know what i mean probably so when you guys are doing design do you guys design with a paywall in mind for certain features and certain things um i don't personally work on any paywall software but i do know people that do and that is a huge factor because there's a lot of back and forth with people in our position who are working on the design of something and we say, oh, it would be great if the user had this. It would make their workflow or whatever it is so much easier. And then marketing comes back and says, yeah, we're going to charge for that. And then we come back and say, yeah, but it's like essential to the app. And so there's a lot of back and forth arguing, or not arguing, uh, negotiating. Sorry. There's a lot of back and forth negotiating that goes on with what should be available and what should not be available behind a paywall. And that gets into like some probably some super deep things when you're designing features versus really fixing a fixing something essential to the experience itself. Right. I mean, I would imagine you guys also have to uh, plan for the idea that these people who people in these paywalls are going to have to be a certain demographic too, right? Because they have to make a certain amount of money to be able to have a dating app that they pay every month twenty thirty dollars for, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure that's a consideration. So so yeah, they would okay. be designing for a different set of users. All right, what's up next? All right, so Resident Evil 7, a new game that came out this week. I think most people know. Uh, well, not most people, but, you know, a lot of people. In your uh, inner circle. In my inner circle. Um, that came out this week is making users feel physically ill due to the strong case of motion sickness. The game's content and game movement and tiny field of view is cited to be the reasoning behind this phenomenon that is uh typically encountered in virtual reality settings so i watched uh the play of this i watched a let's play of this game because i'm not a big horror game fan but i watched a let's play of this thing and i could totally see it it seems like it's a lot of that and i cannot imagine it doing it through vr with all that movement and shaking See, it's it's available in VR too. I haven't actually watched any of this because I don't want to self induce being sick. <laughs> but I was talking with Blake before the show. Blake saw a stream. You saw a stream, Billy. So, but you guys both experienced this just from watching somebody else play. 
Actually, Billy, yeah. you kind of bring up an interesting point. I mean, because I watched it, of course, not in VR. So I was just watching like a, a streamer that I really like. I was mainly watching it for his commentary, but I couldn't even watch the stream for very long because because of, of the like really shaky, almost Blair Witchy camera movements. But I wonder if in VR with it on the yeah, headset, if it felt like you were looking at it, it would be all right. Yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see. Yeah. It's it's also interesting. So, so I'm wondering too. You you guys both don't have direct experience playing this game. I know that when you're in control of something, it reduces the motion sickness, right? So, like if you're if you were to watch that movie Hardcore Henry, which is set all in the first person, a lot of people or like Cloverfield, a lot of people complained of motion sickness uh-huh. because it's taking up. If you're in the theater, it's taking up your full field of view. Yeah. And you're not in control of what you're seeing. Mm-hmm. It's it's less directed than movies, right? It's almost it feels frantic. It feels you know like you're there, like that is who you are. And so when you have that and you're out of control, your brain doesn't know which direction you're going to go next, and so that's what causes the motion sickness. You're seeing things, but you know your inner ear is not accommodating your body in the same way that your eyes are. So that mismatch is why you get motion sickness. Now, when you're in control of something, like you can lean to the left. If you know you're going left, you can lean to the right. If you know you're going right. So now I'm wondering, obviously watching it, you guys had uh, reactions to it. I'm wondering if playing it reduces it, but even players are still experiencing. This is, this is a really interesting phenomenon. Yeah, because I think this article is a well, lot about players know, being feeling sick. I do know that uh, some people talked about Hardcore Henry. They had a people, I had a group of people on, and they talked about how some people would actually bring game controllers to trick themselves into watching it, and holding a game controller actually reduced their motion sickness because they're used to seeing it on a screen while holding a controller. It's almost like a comfort thing, like a steadier, or almost like that. Hmm. You know, that's interesting. And uh, I mean, like, that's the question you have to ask. You're giving up cinematography for virtual reality. You know what I mean? Like, you can't see the guy shake and jut around and things like that in the first person mode with VR. And you can't it kind of takes away from doing it in third person or over the shoulder and over the shoulder could probably still do it, too. Right. Uh, Maybe to a lesser degree, though, because it's not as frantic over the shoulder. It sure is right. still as frantic, but not as much. But I mean, it kind of takes away from the virtual reality aspect, doesn't it? Well, the VR aspect, you're in control. That's what I'm saying, is when you're in control, you're actually moving your head in those directions, and so so there's not a mismatch between what your body is doing and what your brain is doing. Mm-hmm. When you're sitting face forward looking at a screen, your field of view is changing, but your head is not. And that's what causes that's what causes it. All right, what do we but got it next? Looks like a game. All right, so the next one we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about good old fashioned Facebook. All right, so Facebook is beginning to test integrating ads into its mobile messaging apps, user interfaces. <clears throat> the company says it will launch what is characterized as a very small test in Australia and Thailand, which will allow businesses to place an ad on the Messenger home screen. A few screenshots pop up on the internet and the ads appear to be in a card style that includes image thumbnails accompanied with text and a link. I was confused by this one though, because I don't understand. Does that mean like if you and I are chatting on Facebook, we're going to get a Dodge car commercial in the middle of our chat? Human factors cast brought to you by Dodge. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, hopefully not. I mean, you, I would assume that maybe I don't actually know how this works. So, Nick, you might be better to jump in for this part. You know, what I understood from this one is that they were they didn't they weren't very specific and I think that was intentional. I think they're trying it in different sort of configurations. But mm-hmm. um what it looks like from the screenshot is that it's going to be popping up in your contacts list. So, a lot of people use Messenger as a um uh, as a uh, First off, as a contacts manager that integrates your Facebook with your phone contacts and it merges your MMS and your messenger contacts seamlessly. So it's all in one place. Um, I actually use it this way. 
And oh, so, cool. so you can actually use it to like s- go through your contacts and it'll organize your contacts in different ways. And between these, I feel like this is, or at least this is what it looks like. It looks like it'll um, sort of appear in your like overall, like I'm searching for a text message or a message and I'm just scrolling through and I'll see an ad every now and then. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not going to be actually on our chat bubbles, our chat window. Yeah, like not actually inside the chat, but once you hop into the app, like the Messenger app itself, you would right. potentially see an ad. But I mean, these things are honking big. Like these are these are half the screen. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the part that's a little a little sketchy. I mean, they're gonna have to be very careful when they do that. Cause, but I know that there's a lot, obviously Facebook has a huge draw. But I mean, implementing ads oh, yeah. this way, it's. It's kind of dangerous unless you do it in a way that's kind of like YouTube where you can get away from it. You don't necessarily always have to watch it or anything right. like that. Billy, so you mentioned earlier, is there ever a time when we design with a paywall in mind? And this actually yep. is a really good example of that. I bet you some user experience intern was like, yeah, let's not do this because this is <laughs> this is not good for our our users like they'll they'll get upset over this and marketing was like mm, yeah but it will make us money yeah and i don't know yeah. ad targeting is so good nowadays it might not make people as mad as projected too yeah know. it's an interesting yeah. point and the other thing about it is is we have to take in consideration things like uh we have to use the facebook messenger if we want to talk to people on facebook we have to use it well you don't have to use facebook no, we don't have to use Facebook to chat. But why would but you not? If we want to chat with people on Facebook, we on our phones, we have to use the Messenger app. Right. It's almost like it's a, it's a cornered monopoly market. Yeah, I mean, it's a good business move for sure. I would I'd love to know why they chose their test to be in Australia and Thailand. Probably so they don't upset the wrong customer first. Like maybe they did market research. I don't know. This is this yeah. is just hypothetical. I'm I don't work at Facebook. I don't know what's going on inside. But I feel like they did research and was like, Okay, these audiences will probably be the least upset if we introduce these first. Let's test it on them. That's really cool. I'd love to I I don't know. No, I was just I was I just <laughs> Blake it was over awesome. here, mastermind. Because I just think it's really cool that they've obviously done enough research to choose two very specific places to do a small test. I just think it's cool. Whatever marketing stuff's going on, I guess. Yeah, I know some of the guys over at Facebook and, and this seems like one of those moves that they would go, Yeah, this audience like they have a ton of researchers over there that that do nothing but focus in on one little thing. And so I feel like this was one of those tasks where they're like, Okay, Find the audience that will get least upset over this. Cool. All right, Billy, what do we got? Who knows? If it's terrible, we can all go back to Google Plus. Yes. Oh, my. (laughs) Human Factors Cast does not even have a Google Plus. All right, what's next? (laughs) Gemma Sutra published an article this week about the six essential examples of video game UI that every developer should study. Some of these games. Overwatch, Hearthstone, and Assassin's Creed. Gamma Sutra argues that these games are adaptable, compact, simple, and informative. And I tend to agree. I think there should be more games on this thing, but yeah, I think that it's a pretty good idea. Although I've never played actually Half Life 2. But yet your prediction is Half Life 3 for the year. Hey, I just see where the video game trends go. <laughs> well, I thought I thought this was a good article. They kind of point out, you know, it, it's it's a lot of the same stuff that you would find in like a UX magazine or something. It's it, it feels very surface level to me. And Blake is very critical about this. So he's waiting to explode over here. But uh, <laughs> no, it's it's not that I'm critical of it. It's just I feel like you see a lot of these articles, especially now, and it's getting just tiresome. Excuse me, it's getting tiresome, I guess. Uh, but they do point out some pretty good games. And once I read the article a little more in depth, I understand that it's like talking about the, the layout of their heads-up displays. And it's it's cool. I just, I don't know, sometimes I want a little more depth or length to things or more explanation. You're a scientist, Blake. You want a full analysis of every I know. game UI there I know. is. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm horrible for that. Yeah. And Doomsday Clocks. Yeah, see? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted some. I I don't know yet, but I I think some of the things they pointed out were pretty great. I mean, it, and it's a lot of the games I had had experience with, so that was that was nice. The thing in Half Life Two that I thought was cool is they were talking a lot about sound design. I thought that was really sweet. 
You know, like one, making sure you. I don't know. It was just cool. A little cool article by Gamma Sutra. Uh, I'm under NDA. I can't say anything. I. I. There's something in this that's really resonating with me, but I can't say anything. Yeah. Yeah. Dang it. Nope. Shoot. Nope. Want to talk about your dark arts that you do for the military. It's totally <laughs> mechs, Billy. It's mechs. It's always mechs. All right. What's up next? Before I break my NDA. <laughs> All right. So, well, since we got a little bit weird, let's get a little bit weirder. Ooh. An international team of scientists created a pig-human hybrid in a research project that raises the prospect organs for transplantation and might someday be grown according to researchers published in the journal Cell. The scientists created the hybrid by injecting human stem cells uh, uh, into any type of body tissue, into a pig embryo. It was a trial and error process, according to National Geographic. The embryos were placed back into the pig and removed to analyze three or four weeks later. A total of 186 were collected, according to the research. Now, isn't this just stem stem cells? It is. But now we're going to officially change the title of the show to Human Pig Factors Cast, because we can't just keep humans in here. We have to keep the human pigs. Men. Hybrid show. Man pig. Man, Man bear pig. pig. The South Park. <laughs> so, that was a South Park episode, right? Oh, they have a really nice video breaking this down on CNET. Um, kind of shows this. But uh, the process, I won't get into that. But just the implications of this uh, kind of tangentially related to human factors. I mean, let's say you lose an arm or an appendage or, or something. This this human pig mm-hmm. hybrid could grow you an extra arm, and they could surgically place it back on. Well, like, I mean, even pull it back a little bit further than that. I mean, right now they do stem cell shots into people's shoulders for torn tissue that can rebuild it, but they're using right. they're doing that based off or taking it from human placenta, right? So that's that's not always going to have like a massive supply as this gets cheaper because right now those right. kinds of surgeries are so expensive. So, I mean, it does have a giant impact on, okay, if we can pull this from pigs without any kind of real harm to them, uh, why not? And it allows more people to be able to maybe be functional in their older age and stuff like that. So, it's cool stuff. Freak me out when it said human-pig hybrid. So, question real quick. Does the pig give birth to an arm or just cells that can be an arm? (laughs) Because one's a lot weirder than the other. Well, we'll have to figure out, figure that out at a later time. I don't know. Weeks, I'm not out of foot. No, I think what they do is they just <laughs> harvest those cells, and that's yeah. able to be built into you know helping rebuild tissues. I don't think <laughs> you're actually giving birth to a human ear. Right. See, I'm a little disappointed in this because I really want cyborgs, and we're seeming to go in a different direction than cyborgs. Just superhumans. What's up next? <laughs> Super pig George guys. Orwell's dystopian classic, 1984, one of my favorite books, occupied the num- number one Amer- Amazon's best-selling books list last week. It's a cautionary tale about a brutal, amoral dictator who evidently felt relevant to people lately for some reason. Huh. But as of... I wonder why. I wonder why that's so relevant. Yeah, that's a strange one. Yeah. It's kind of weird that there was a giant spike in that, though, right? Yeah. Well, so weird. I just remember. Well, what was that, Billy? Sorry. What George Orwell said, you know. You know, I just remember what George Orwell said. He controls the past, controls the future. He controls, who controls the media. The present controls the past. What about he who you controls know? the media? And oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. Fa- all right. I'm trying not to be political. All right. Yeah, this is a great thing that. This book is on sale and is the top seller. It's an awesome book. I think most people should read it. It's uh, I mean, it's a. Uh, I wonder if there is a correlation between what's going on in our world and it being sold out or something else. Yeah, it could be something else. Who knows? I I wonder about that though. I wonder if you can actually make a correlation about what a country is feelings are towards there's certain like political or social climate based on the top sellers of that country. You know what I mean? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, by the way, I'm just going to make a shout out to this website called spurious correlations. Where <laughs> <laughs> have you have you visited this website? Okay. Okay. Spurious correlations. No. It's basically like 
um, two things that you would never, ever, ever think would have in common, like number of films Nicolas Cage is in by year and suicides. Like like flavor of ice cream eaten that year and serial murders. Right, exactly. Oh, God, I want this link. Oh, you got to text me this link right it's now. It's uh, Spurious Correlations. I think it's SpuriousCorrelations.com. If you Google it, you'll find it. There's a ton of great stuff there. All right, enough about political stuff. I, I'm done with political stuff for today. Billy, let's end this on a high note. What's up next? We're going to talk about robots. Robots. A video of a robot completing I'm Not a Robot CAPTCHA fought, showed up on the internet this week, signaling the start to the robot uprising. I knew it! So, after showing the CAPTCHA who's boss, it drops the stylus like an epic mic drop. Have you guys seen this video? <laughs> I have. Oh my gosh. The googly eyes on the robot make the whole thing. <laughs> and the mic drop, the, the stylus drop at the end is just perfect. Yeah, I encourage Oops. anybody to follow the link when we post it. Oh yes. If you want to watch the video, because it's yeah. great. For all, you, for all of you interested, in, we do post all these links on our Facebook. We post the show notes. So way you guys can see what we're talking about. Billy, did you have a chance to check out this video? Not yet. And I mean, well, I did watch it. Yeah, I watched it. It was really cool when he dropped the stylus at the end. But I think it might just be me, but I felt a little bit like, how do I know a guy's not controlling it? Well... You don't, but that's what makes it fun. There likely so is somebody controlling. I think it's a little taken out of context, but I don't, it could be the design of the robot was really cool. It I, I, I like the the humanoid aspect to it because it looked basically like an an elbow wrist type motion. Yeah, it did. It was cool. All right, well, that's going to be it for Human Factors News this week. Let's take a minute to catch up with our listeners. We want to hear from you guys. So if something we say on the show resonates with you, let us know. We'll read it. Your story on the show. Oh, I'm gonna. I know I'm gonna mess this name up. Is it Rice or Reese? Rice. 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 R H Y C E. Uh, I think I'm it's Rice. Rice. All right, Rice. I'm sorry if it's Reese. If it's Reese, write us back. We'll apologize. Hey, Human Factors. Ca- Reese writes. Hey, Human Factors cast. Last week, I was listening to you guys while I was in DIA. What's DIA? Oh, oh. Uh, at, we'll get there. Uh, Denver International Airport, and was surprised to hear. That they have the fastest Wi-Fi. I thought it was funny that you guys mentioned it while I was literally using Denver's internet. Uh, uh, loving loving all the HF news. Keep up the great work. P.S. I enjoyed Human Factors 20 questions, and it was fun to play along with you guys from home. Ear cons was pretty tough. Go easy on us and Billy next week. Thanks for the great podcast, Rice or Reese. Well, thank you for writing in, Rice or Reese. Um, Reese. <laughs> we love hearing your feedback. If you want to write in like Reese did, you know, stuff like this really keeps us going. We just love hearing from you guys. No matter what it is, we just like knowing that somebody is out there listening and that we made your day. Uh, so that's it for hearing from our listeners. But let's switch gears and play a game. Much like last week, we're going to play a new game this week called Guess That Human Factor. Now, this is a game where Billy will read the description of a human factors construct, topic, research area, or pretty much anything else, uh, and we're going to have to guess what it is. Um, We sourced this week's topics from a few of our colleagues. They sent them directly to Billy, but we want to get them from you guys. So send us an email with your suggestions to humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Billy, what do we got up first for this one? All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this one. We're going to start out simple. A specific purpose and are required to achieve a goal. This is going to be a little tough with all the connection issues. What what was that again? Sorry. Activities that have a specific purpose and are required to achieve a goal. Is that task? That's what it sounds like to me. You didn't say task in there, dude. You said activities. Activities. Activities required. That sounds like a task. That sounds like a task to me. Is a task mm-hmm. it's goal oriented? No, it is can not you, task. Hang on, hang on. Before you give us the answer, can you read it one more time? Activities that have a specific purpose and are required to achieve a goal. I want. I, it sounds it's like, like key tasks, or yeah, it something. sounds like goal oriented tasks. Yeah, key tasks. Activities. You're close. You're getting close. Oh, geez, key. What does GOM stand for? Goals, Goals operators, operators. Um, methods. Yeah, that's never mind. It's not going to work. Uh, do, 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 do. I don't know. Oh. I want to say 
I want to say goal directed or goal oriented something or another. Well, before that, let me give you guys a uh, let me give you guys something along the lines of um, an idea, like a, okay. a situation. Uh, to order, perform, and interpret a blood test result, different people have specific functions. E.g., clinicians form diagnosis and select appropriate tests. The f- phlebotomist collects samples from patients. The porter provides transport. The pathology path, <laughs> pathology lab analyzes samples, and clinicians interpret results and make diagnosis. So, is this like um, a role specific task? Nope. Well, yeah. It, it. I mean, like overarching. I give up. What is it? Yeah, you win. Functions. Functions. <laughs> Like derivatives? Activities. All right, all right. What's up next? That's cool. All right, all right. The mental and physical demands placed on a person by task requirements, workplace environment, and organization. Workload. Workload. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it workload? Right. Yeah, it's workload. Definitely. All right, cool. Okay. The difference between the skills of an individual or a group compared to with the demands of a job or task they may be required to perform. For example, if change to the required very different way of working, or new technology, then wow. there may be a Thanks. Hey Billy. Hey Billy, yeah, could you could you redo that one, buddy? <laughs> sure. I'm getting a lot of that. I'll try through it. The difference between the skill of an individual or group they may be required to perform. Oh man, we are we are having some really bad connection issues with Billy here. Bummer. Let's uh let's give him one more shot. Hey Billy, are you are you still with us? Yeah. Computer. On my end. Are you are you still with us, Billy? No. I can't hear you guys. You can't hear us. Billy, Billy, are you are you still with us? I think the doomsday clock is ticking down even farther, guys. We got to end the show now. Oh wait, there you are. Okay, okay, all right. Let's let's give this like let's give uh, one more try. Go ahead. Okay, one more time. The difference rules of an individual with the demand of a job or task they make. Bummer. All right, Doomsday, <laughs> Doomsday is here. We're gonna have to end the show there. <laughs> That's it for today. If you have any suggestions for games topics, we'll finish this one next week when we have a better connection with Billy. Um, if you have any suggestions for games topics or news stories that you want us to cover, you can follow us on social media. You can head on over to the uh, Human Factors uh, Cast Facebook site, comment on our SoundCloud, reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. Or you can leave us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Uh, you can also leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We love it when you guys support us financially to keep doing what we're doing, bringing you the news every week. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on iTunes, which is probably the best, best place to reach us, uh, Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. Thanks to my panel for being on the show today. Blake, where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter at UXChillBro. And Billy Hall, if you're still there, where can they find you? You can find me on YouTube if the world doesn't end. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, doomsday is ticking. It depends. It depends. It depends. It depends. It depends.